Welcome to Learning Through Technology, a K-12 EdTech podcast brought to you by STS Education. We strive to be the bridge that connects communities of educators so that they can fulfill the promise of learning through technology. Join us every other week as we connect with education leaders who share their deep experience with the education and technology topics you are grappling with in your own schools and districts. Each interview is designed to bring you tangible ideas you can start using tomorrow. I'm Alex Inman, the founder of Educational Collaborators. And I'm Bob Sabruti, founder of the Edutech Group. Welcome to the show. Bob, today we have a spectacular guest. I always say that, but I truly, truly mean that. Denise Musselwhite is incredible. I've had the chance to know her for over a decade, work with her in Educational Collaborator. She is a phenomenal woman and a phenomenal leader. What are you looking forward to today? So our company is a technology company. You know, we work with schools and we have engineers and technicians. So we certainly don't have a 50-50 split of women in our company to men. While we would love to have that, it's a challenge. And I'm hoping that we have a couple of women on our senior leadership team that are women. But I'm hoping that Denise can give us some more insight into what it's like to be a woman in technology leadership or in technology in general, and what we can do to identify more leaders and to put them in places to benefit them and us. We're not out to do it just to do good. We would all be better off with more diverse thought process than the rooms that look like you and I. Well, knowing Denise, you're going to get exactly that and more. So what do you say we get started? Yeah, let's go. Welcome, everybody. Today, we are honored to host Denise Acosta Musselwhite, a former CIO on a mission to liberate diverse tech professionals from the pressures of leadership. With over two decades of senior leadership across diverse sectors, Denise stands out as one of the rare Latina women globally to hold chief information officer and board chair positions, achievements shared only by 5% of professionals worldwide. Denise's expertise in tech talent management and her visionary Thrive operating system make her a transformative voice. As founder of Tech and Thrive, she dedicates her career to empowering diverse tech professionals. Join us as Denise shares insights and strategies for fostering diversity and empowerment in the tech industry. Whether you're an established professional or an aspiring leader, this episode promises inspiration and practical wisdom. Let's dive in. Welcome, Denise. Hi, I'm so glad to be here. This is exciting. (laughs) So glad to have you on the show. You've obviously not been with us before if you find this exciting, but we appreciate the low bar. (laughs) You two are going to make it hard for me not to laugh during this podcast. Hey, you just go ahead. Bob needs that opportunity for self-confidence. So, okay, it is easy to provide laughter since this is video and Alex is right here for us to look at. So there is that. Oh, no, (laughs) that's so mean. All right. That's enough insulting, Alex. Let's start talking about Denise. (laughs) So Denise, through educational collaborators and through the independent school tech world, I've known you for well over a decade, and it's been my absolute pleasure to know you. Your story is truly incredible. Kind of tell us where you started as a professional and sort of how you came to be where you are today. Okay. I'm excited to share that. It's kind of an interesting story because most people don't realize that I am the daughter of Puerto Rican and Dominican parents who immigrated to the United States when they were themselves in high school. They moved to New York. And so they moved to New York when they were 13 separately. They didn't know each other yet. And about a decade later, They got married and they had their first child, which happened to be me. And they decided in their wisdom to name their auto service station, because my dad is a mechanic by trade, Denise's service station. And I grew up, like literally grew up in an automobile service station while my parents built this business. And fast forward 10 years later, they moved us to Orlando, Florida, seeking the American dream which is clearly found where Mickey Mouse lives. That was literally (laughs) the reason that they moved to Central Florida. Did they open a service shop in Orlando? They did. They did not name the new service shop, Denise's Service Station. They named it High Tech Tune-Up. And I was in middle school at the time. 
my dad had to purchase his first high tech computer diagnostic for the cars who had changed from being analog to digital. They now had digital error codes. And yours truly was in charge of translating the computer diagnostic guide to my dad and all of his Spanish speaking mechanics. I was 12 years old when I got that job out of necessity. And the rest is history. So it sounds to me like you were the CIO already of high tech tune up when you were 12 years old. You were the first middle school CIO. (laughs) I never thought of it that way, but I guess I was. I mean, it was out of necessity. My parents needed to figure out how to use this thing. I spoke fluent English and I was a typical, really curious kid. I took everything apart anyway because I lived in a family with my dad being a mechanic. It wasn't scary. And he handed me that tech, that guide, which was thousands of pages and said, you speak better English than most of us. Can you figure this out and tell us what to do here? And I did for all of middle school and most of high school. That was my after school responsibility. Wow. So I knew you when you were as a CIO at Trinity Prep in Florida, but you worked in tech before in other industries before education, correct? Yes. I was a technology manager, director of technology for a very large law firm that had offices all over the state of Florida. And I also worked in a service provider's office that delivered ATM networks to industry. So I don't know if you all, anybody listening who is old enough to remember ATM networks, these were prior to fiber. And I was the person who dispatched all of their engineers and ordered all of the equipment for large scale installations. I did that while I was in college, pursuing my technology management degree. Ah, nice. So, Denise, when did you make the decision to shift into education technology and why did you make that decision? For me, it was about practicality. Working as a technology director in a large law firm required me to work 24-7. It was a very heavy litigation firm. And I knew I wanted to start a family, but I also wanted to pursue my career in technology. And my former boss at the time recommended me to the role at Trinity Prep, knowing that I lived near the school and that I was perfectly capable of doing that job. And he recommended me and I went on the interview and realized that it was a perfect match because I wanted to start a family and have more balance. And a school's technology was a challenge that I could undertake and also raise my family without giving up so much after hours. Nice. That's great. So how do you get to here where you have your own management company and you are working with women leaders throughout the world. So that's still a big leap. Like even Alex and I got to be tech directors at one point, but we're not doing what you're doing. (laughs) Yeah. So the pandemic was a time of great change for me and many other professionals. I helped to lead my school at the time through the pandemic. And I'm going to toot our horn here. We were able to transition in that pandemic It was beautiful. We really did an outstanding job of transitioning in the pandemic to help our students get online full time and for their parents to support them and for all of our faculty to get online. Having that experience was really affirming that I knew what I was doing because we were able to do that because of the team that I led and because of the decisions I had made over a more than 15 year career there. More importantly, I realized after the pandemic that I totally missed the pandemic with my children. I have three kids and my husband and I were both essential in the pandemic. And our three kids were home trying to figure out the world in a pandemic and neither one of us was really available for them. And when I sat back and thought about like, what am I doing here? I helped my school get ready and deliver in a pandemic, and I wasn't available for my own children. That really gave me pause. And I had to reimagine what my work-life balance was so that I could be present for my youngest, who is 11, in a way that was more meaningful to me 
and also pursue my career. So it, it's kind of like what I did when I left legal so that I could practically support a family and pursue my passion. I did that again two years ago. So I'm already jealous that you've twice decided to pursue something for you when a lot of us seem like we're doing what we have to do and you are making these choices. So now tell us a bit about what the new endeavor is like, what you've been doing for the last couple of years. That's actually when we've met. So I've kind of got to follow along. I'm a avid subscriber to the newsletter, so I get to keep up on how you're doing. But tell us a bit about your endeavor now. Well, Tech and Thrive was born out of necessity. I, as a woman in tech, really understood how unique I was, even more unique as a Latina in tech. For my entire career, I only met or interacted with a handful of other women in CIO roles. And for the most part, I was sitting in those boardrooms and those rooms of decision with men and not a lot of people of color. And that felt really isolating to me a lot of the time. And it also created a lot of insecurity because no one else looked like me or had experiences like mine, especially in independent schools. We all know that independent schools are a privileged environment for the most part. And I just didn't see myself in that leadership team in a way that felt authentic to me. I was very, very different than them. I think that that was a great advantage to them to have someone with a diverse opinion, diverse, you know, that was great. But when I realized that I wanted to work and support people who felt that way, I wanted to find them. I wanted them to find me and I wanted to be able to support them more intentionally. And when I paid attention to why people were coming to me that last five years of my career as a CIO, much of it was because they were seeking my support to accelerate their own growth, not because they needed help with the server that wasn't working. Right. It's that softer cultural side. And one of the things Bob and I have talked about a lot is that the role of a successful CIO has to, way more to do with people than it has to do with tech. But oftentimes the people who are in the hiring positions for that position don't understand that. And so they choose somebody who can do stuff but not manage people and not manage change. And I spent a good number of years in independent schools myself. I would venture to guess there are not many who were raised by immigrant auto mechanics. But think of the spectacular, I'm sure they didn't feel very spectacular at the time, but the challenges that your parents went through and that you guys went through and how that prepares you for an empathy, a level of empathy and understanding and support for others that, some of your peers may not have. I just think it's awesome. I absolutely know that my parents created that environment for us of empathy. They also were incredibly clear that we were to be educated and successful. Like I didn't get to choose not to be educated and successful. My parents said, that is what you have to do. This is why we're sacrificing for you. So I took that very seriously. And when I think about what you said about how schools and organizations hire technologists, they hire for technical skill. And when they offer them to professional development resources, the technologist and the organization is quick to say yes to more training on technical skill. But very limited resources go to developing their people management and leadership acumen, but they promote them out of individual contributor roles into leadership with no preparation whatsoever. And they have to look at what their organization has to offer as leaders to learn. There's nothing really helping them lean into their leadership. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's why your organization is so valuable, so needed. I need to share a quick story though, Bob, because this is always a good personal interest side of this before we move on. I know. Wait, 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 wait. Is this a story about you or about Denise? Denise. Okay. Okay. You can go ahead. Your story time's over. 
<laughs> I'm a little scared. I'm scared now. Okay. No, I had the pleasure of being present when Denise sort of officially launched to the independent school world her new company at the uh, National Business Officers Association conference. And so it's a morning session, like eight or nine a.m. session, right? And so people are kind of dragging in all a little bit foggy eyed still. And whoever was presenting next door to Denise was genius. They were serving mimosas at their session to attract people from the hallway. People are walking in the hallway and saying, well, I was going to go see Denise, but this one has mimosas. Denise goes into the room, meets the person, talks to them, gets friends with them in like 12 seconds flat, and then comes back with mimosas and encourages other people to go grab mimosas and come back to her session. So it's 9 a.m. I'm sitting in a room with a bunch of very, very happy people listening to Denise announce the value of her <laughs> of her organization. It was fascinating. Well, maybe it was fascinating because I got a mimosa out of the deal. <laughs> you know what's even funnier about that is now having mimosas for the women in tech sessions that I do is like part of the script. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so now I stole that idea and I bring mimosas, both alcoholic and non-alcoholic versions to the talks that I do that are for women in tech and other people in tech who are interested to see me hearing what I have to say. So now mimosas are like part of my like tagline. <laughs> <laughs> so she's a marketing <laughs> genius as well. Exactly. I can speak to Denise's quality to draw you in. The first time Denise and I spoke, first time I met her, we we're in the lobby of a hotel and I bet we spent two hours talking and it went by in a flash. I had to excuse myself to call and say goodnight to my daughter because it had just gone on so long. So I get where you're coming from, Alex. No <laughs> one can deny the force of Denise. No, nope. nobody tries either. I'm so authentically curious about every single person's journey and story and how I might be able to accelerate or catalyze what they want out of life professionally. That's like totally my jam. I can't help <laughs> it. <laughs> so sometime soon, Denise is going to help me because we know how engineers work as leaders and I could use all the help I can get. So I do want to talk about you had spoke about being a woman in technology and is an owner of a, the Edutech crew. So we employ engineers and technicians in schools. And we're fortunate to have a very gifted engineer on our senior leadership team who has been part of our company for 15 years and a former head of school as part of our leadership team that's a woman. But I don't know the struggle. So can you tell us something about how it's different or what the challenges you've seen as in any aspect of technology, whether it's a leadership or when you're first getting your start in technology? Well, I think that it's the story of feeling like you don't belong because the systems and the structures that accelerate progress and leadership were really designed by men for men. So what I've learned in my research is that Women are more relational. We're just wired biologically to be more relational and men are wired to be more transactional. So just by default, the leadership ladder is very transactional and women are more relational. So you find yourself trying to squeeze yourself as someone who doesn't work or look like everyone who is a leader into a mold that doesn't fit you really. And I did that for a long time. And everyone does that in a meeting, you know, or in an environment to try to get through what is necessary to excel. But for women, there's extra work. I'm going to share this with you. This is really interesting. I do this three-dimensional assessment with every single person that I work with, which gives them a very, very detailed three report feedback about their unique leadership. If I compare the men that I work with to the women that I work with, most of the women are perfectionists and men don't carry that trait as strongly. So women are showing up to these meetings like 150% more ready than other people in that room to overcompensate for what they think they lack. So we're just exhausted. It's exhausting because we're doing like 
a job and a half. Running a school or district is hard. Your tech shouldn't be. With HP as your trusted partner in program success, you get more than just beautiful, future-proof technology. You get a team dedicated to your growth. Experience cutting-edge innovation, unmatched reliability, and personalized support, all tailored to fit your unique needs. From high-performance laptops and printers to innovative software solutions, HP has you covered wherever you work. Visit us today at hp.com or stsed.com. So you say that, that's entirely consistent with my experience. And you know, in educational collaborators, we have a disproportionate number of women consultants in our organization. We actually have a majority of women consultants in our organization, despite the fact that women are a minority in tech leadership. And so I think what has the reason that is so is because I see that level of perfectionism. I see that level of effort. I see that level of work in my female colleagues in ed tech. And I want our clients to have that. And so I seek that. Am I being exploitive by seeking women to be our consultants because they work harder? <laughs> Not if you pay them fairly. <laughs> I pay them the same as men and they usually get more work. So hopefully I'm good there. There you go. Yeah. I mean, they ultimately decide to partner with you because you are filling something important in their roles. And I opted to work with you, Alex, because I know that you are an authentic leader and because you are like a true ally to people and you lift people up authentically because of you're just a great partner. Well, thank you. It's really because I know that women in tech, because of that extra work that they have to do, that has just become part of their DNA as workers. And I know that you Connie, Lindy, I know that these incredible women in our organization are going to bring that effort every time when they work with our clients. And I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's a slam dunk, right? I think it is actually one of the most missed opportunities. Women in tech is a missed opportunity because of what you just described. I mean, I'm not surprised that your data shows that because it's entirely consistent with what I have experienced in my career. Bob, you have some women in your leadership team. We do, and we're fortunate to have them, as I said. But I think I just can't get over the fact that you said Alex is a good partner and a leader. <laughs> this is my struggle. He is. You set me up for the insult, but he is. He really, he really is a really good partner at this. Don't tell anybody. Fortunately, nobody listens to this podcast, though. <laughs> nobody so no will ever will know. <laughs> He's also really, really fun. So fun loving. Oh, well, I haven't seen that part yet, but <laughs> I'll keep waiting on that. So I digressed so that I could compliment Alex. No more for you. <laughs> so we're fortunate to be growing our company, but we're always in a position of we see value in the diversity of color or sex, of course. And what can we as companies or as schools do to recruit and retain women in technology, whether it's technicians and engineers or leaders? I, there's so much that is an opportunity. I actually created like a 10 steps to retain your tech leaders flyer or image, which I can share with your listeners. You can link that in the show notes. Representation is the top way, which is continuing to provide opportunities for people who exist in the organization currently to move up and to put them into a leadership path, even if you don't see them as ready yet, but to invest in them when they are individual contributors by providing them access to those soft skills that are so important. The other is by, this is something that I share with people I speak with, more often than not, our disposition is to wait for someone who you report to to tell you whether you're good or not at what you do and to give you specific examples of how you are a good leader or how you are a good whatever your role is. My call to action for every single person that's listening, whether you're a woman, a man, or anyone who's listening, mm -hmm. is it really is important for you yourself to understand what your natural strengths and talents are 
and for you to articulate them to the people you report to so that they can help you fit into roles that align with where you have strengths. So I'm going to say that again. Don't wait for your evaluation and for someone else to describe for you why you're good at what you do. That's not going to accelerate progress for you. You really need to get real about what you're good at and pay attention to the evidence that you create in your role that you're good at that. So that when you get to that evaluation meeting, you are speaking about yourself in a way that highlights the work that you're doing. Don't wait. Keep tabs on it. You're doing amazing things. Don't wait for somebody else to notice. Write them down and tell them about it. That's spectacular advice. And I think it actually addressed one of the challenges that I had in my head as Bob asked that question is, as I have offered positions, I haven't had as many women candidates as male candidates for various positions. And so I find myself doing some of that kind of for some of my candidates, not just my female candidates, right? But I try to also kind of draw those things out of the candidates. But I think that's incredible advice. And when women do that, they're also building their confidence when anyone does that. This is independent of just women. I think that women disproportionately don't do what you just advocated for. But when anybody does that, it increases their confidence and then hopefully helps them tell themselves, I can apply for that job. I'm qualified for that job or I could be great at that job. Even if I'm not qualified for it yet today, I would be great for that job. And then when you find somebody like Bob, who's looking for people to add the value of their diverse experience and background, it's easier for him to find them when they sort of put that out there and say, hey, I would be great at that job. Oh, great. Let me give you that opportunity. The other, I think, advice I can give to CEOs like Bob and to you, Alex, and to other people who are hiring and are wanting to see diversity in their candidate pool is to seek non-homogenous places to go after those professionals. There are organizations like Latinos in tech, Blacks in tech, Asians in tech, women in tech that you can go to specifically and share your roles with so that eyes get on those opportunities in a way that may not be part of your natural HR process because you're typically connected. If you pay attention to who you're connected to, most of the people that you're connected to may look just like you. So then you're not (laughs) going to get a lot of diversity. Actually, Fortunately, most don't look like me, and this is just good for all of society. <laughs> I 100% agree with Alex. <laughs> oh, no. I get your point, of course. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, a, I, mean, I never even thought of that. Like, we just advertise jobs. Like, this is where people go. But of course, there are organizations that have a focal point around specific ethnicity or sex or whatever that, even if we weren't doing it, why not cast a broader net? It's a challenge to find people who are skilled and want to work already. It's so true. All right. So I want to move on to another topic real fast. So you've just been announced as one of the inaugural board members for Women in Tech and Entrepreneurship. So first off, congratulations. Tell us a little bit about this organization and what they do and how they do it. So the organization was founded by this really brilliant woman named Rachel, and her dream is to remove barriers that exist to having women in tech self-promote and connect with entrepreneurs who can help them get into roles, have opportunities for venture capital, to network with one another without drama and without feeling like they need to fit in. And what's so unique about it is the programming that they offer is all 100% free. There is no fee to become a member. All of the programming is free. We spend a lot of time and energy creating social activities and chapter teaching that is free to attendees. So removing any financial barrier to women who may not have access to those professional learning funds through their employers is one of the core missions of the organization. 
What's so unique about it is it brings women in technology plus entrepreneurs and other spaces to the group. So just imagine this room of women in tech, and then it could be someone who started a marketing company or someone who started a whatever. It's entrepreneurs in any field or in industry connected to women in tech. It's real magic. That's great. And hopefully you can add some information about this organization into our show notes. I think we could probably make a whole other episode just about this organization and the work that they're doing. So the chapters started in Florida and they're, we're looking to expand throughout the United States to have women who want to start a chapter in their own area. Have you currently reached outside of Florida or is currently everybody in all the chapters in Florida? Our newest chapters in, outside of Florida will launch in 2024, but right now we're in Florida. Nice. Okay, great. So we've come to the time, Denise, and I don't want to put any pressure on you in this, but I'm on a streak here. So you got to help me out here. Alex and I have a little friendly wager. He owes me a bunch right now, but here's <laughs> our question for you. Who was your favorite teacher or most influential and why? Oh my gosh, this one is easy for me because <laughs> I had this teacher in ninth grade. Her name was Nancy Gallion at Winter Park High School here in Central Florida. And she recognized potential in me in our business essentials class. You know, that class you took to like learn typing on those old style typewriters and we used an Apple IIe and all things techie, right? She could see that I had potential and she took me by the hand, connected me with opportunities that I could tap into. She got me into a program that allowed me to finish high school faster so that I could go start to go to work. So after ninth grade, she got me into this program where I was able to complete all of my high school, like by the time I was at the end of a sophomore year. And then for my junior and senior year, I left campus after second period to go to work. And she got me a job at a law firm. And my first job in that law firm when I was 15 years old, because I was 15 when I was a junior, okay, because I was younger than everybody else, was to learn how to help that law firm back up all of their computers. They had this tape drive that they didn't know how to use. So I literally walked in and they said, do you think that you could help us when you get off school to back up all of the computers in this office with this thing? Here's the manual. Guess what I had already been doing in my dad's shop? I literally said, oh yeah, I can figure that out. Just give it to me and I'll do it tomorrow. They gave me the job. And I spent the rest of high school learning alongside brilliant attorneys, telling them about what I was doing because they didn't understand zip. They understand a zip about backing up the, the giant towers that were under their desks. And whenever they deleted files, which happened all the time, they had to come to little 15 year old me to recover them for them. Talk about confidence building. <laughs> so. First off, I would guess that your ninth grade teacher did not have any former 12-year-old CIOs in the class. <laughs> so that was probably an advantage that you, that you already had. And Bob has customers or people who are about to hire his company who don't even have backup as sophisticated as what you were doing back then. 100% <laughs> true there, yep. <laughs> well, in addition to coaching people on leadership, I am a great partner to non-technical CEOs because I can advise them on what they should be paying attention to while I coach them with regard to technology. So if we have any non-technical CEOs out there, I'm the best coach for you because I can <laughs> keep your technology house in order while also coaching you in your executive development. It's like getting a twofer. Yeah. But yeah. So Nancy Gallion, if you're listening I want to thank you personally. I wrote her a letter many, many years ago, but I don't know where she is. I've tried to find her. She did me a solid by helping me get into that program. I think the program was called DECA, D-E-C-A at the time. 
and to get me connected with a law firm so that I could teach all of these really brilliant attorneys how to restore their backup files when I was 15 and 16 years old. DECA programs still exist, and I think that they're really fantastic. And so that's great. So you mentioned a few resources already on this call. Well, are there any other resources that you want to share with our listeners right now? And we can include those in the call notes. Yeah. So I don't know when this podcast is going to air, but in early March, I am going to offer a women in tech group cohort for a small group of women to go through the Thrive operating system that I created. It's a 12-week program. We meet every other week for group coaching, and it's been very, very successful for the women who've participated in the past. So I'll be launching that again. Information of that about that will come through my newsletter and to my subscriber list. So I encourage anyone who's interested in getting my newsletter to subscribe via my website, which I'll provide to you all. But for a quick shortcut, it's techthrive.me. Anyone who's listening can go to techthrive.me to see my website and subscribe to my newsletter. I have a really fun online quiz there that people can take to self-assess their leadership. And I want to point out that half my clients are men. So despite the fact that you see me speaking to women in tech through my newsletter, interestingly, men enjoy working with me too. Oh, that does not surprise me at all. I mean, I've learned so much from you over the time that we've known each other. I promise any listener that there's no one that would not gain substantially from working with Denise. So Denise, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. This was a ton of fun. And I think a really valuable message for our audience to hear and learn from. And and I hope that they have a chance to connect with you. Oh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to your audience and to hear you two crack jokes on each other. I listen to the podcast, but now that I'm here, I actually feel a little bad for Alex. Alex, you've got to stick up for yourself. Uh, You don't have to feel bad for Alex. And he sticks up for himself plenty here. I think Bob's doing a little bit of bullying here and you need to step it up. You've obviously not seen when we present at a conference and Alex takes all of my time. (laughs) I take no more than two thirds of your time. Right. right. Bob, I've really enjoyed getting to know you too. I'm giving you a hard time. I know that you're a wonderful human being and that you two are just being guys. Something like that. (laughs) Denise, it was wonderful for you to come to our podcast and help us understand better some stuff that Alex and I don't understand, right? Most of the rooms that we sit in in technology look a lot like Alex and I, and we're looking for ways to make it look a little different. Well, I'm glad that you're doing your part. And thanks again for having me on. So Alex, Denise, everything you promised and more in the intro, right? She's amazing. (laughs) And once again, makes me feel inadequate in what I've accomplished in my life so far. (laughs) No, no shame in that being true for most people, though. (laughs) That's true. I'm sure the list is long of people who haven't accomplished what Denise has so far. What did you get out of the conversation with Denise? Well, I mean, so much. But the one moment that really stuck out to me was when you were asking her about what managers can do to sort of attract and retain women talent. And she kind of turned the conversation to directly young women in tech and gave them tips on how to make themselves more visible to managers. Let them see, I can do that. I want to do that. I see myself doing that. And though I think that that is spectacular advice for young people, I think the thing that we can gain from that as managers, Bob, is if we just create space for them to do that and then listen, then I think it would have just those two small things would have an enormous impact on the number and role of women in the tech industry. I was struck by the same thing. I'd asked the question, what can we do to recruit and retain women in technology? And I thought she was going to tell me, Bob, these are the things that you have to do. These are the things your company has to offer. This is how you have to approach or work with women. And instead, she said, women, this is what you have to do to look out for yourself. And she said she works with men as well. And isn't that advice great for men too? Now, maybe you and I are biased to see what a man is accomplishing more than a woman. And we try to fight that. And that's why we have people like Denise on our show. But to that point, though, it's great advice for a man 
in the world too. If you're trying to move ahead, your resume, your work is your biggest voice. And then advocating for yourself is the best you can do. Yeah. I mean, we brought her on to speak about women in technology leadership, but what she really just speaks of is just good leadership. And we all can grow from that. Well, another great guest, another great show, another person to humble us. So Bob, until next time. See you next time, Alex. Learning Through Technology, a K-12 ed tech podcast is brought to you by STS Education, a Pacific one source company. To learn more about how educators can leverage technology to drive successful educational outcomes, check us out at www.stsed.com. Connect with us by searching for Learning Through Technology in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or anywhere else podcasts are found. And click subscribe so you don't miss an episode. On behalf of the team at STS Education, thanks for joining us.